In the last week, several reports in the largest Western media outlets have confirmed what we have known for years, but that for some reason has been controversial to say and would have earned you the honorable prefix of conspiracy theorist, had you said it out loud. Last weekend, the New York Times published this rather astonishing piece about the U.S. spy war inside Ukraine. It openly discusses how deep the ties between the U.S. and Ukrainian intelligence units go. It also claims that the relationship is 10 years old. On the other hand, the French, the Germans and the British have now admitted to their own military involvement in eastern front lines. While many commentators believe that most of this talk has been published in support of the 61 billion US dollars that are currently blocked in the US House, my fears go deeper. These latest shifts are probably the sign that the establishment is willing to contemplate the failure of the Ukraine proxy war, which, if true, brings us to a very dangerous fork in how this thing can go on from here. You see, when a proxy war fails, there are really only two options left. Either accept the failure and let the proxy war go, or double down by transforming the war into a direct confrontation. Let's look at the reports and try to draw some conclusions. So here's the main piece, like what was published uh, about eight, nine days ago now on Sunday last week, the spy war, how the CIA secretly helps Ukraine fight Putin. And this one has already received a lot of attention in, uh, especially here on YouTube, because a lot of people try to make sense of it, because it's just so bizarre that at this point, the New York Times would publish something that is obviously meant to, to pretend to be real journalism, investigative journalism, but is actually just more or less again, a, a, a PR stunt um, to make the U US and Ukraine spy agencies look extremely good. But beyond that, it's kind of questionable what this piece is supposed to achieve. Now, I've said this before, right? But at this point, when we know that something is outright propaganda, and this propaganda is directly connected to the state, as this one is, um, the question is, so which parts of the state, in this case, the, the US um, permanent war state or whatever you want to call it, which part of it is responsible for this and what do they want to achieve with it so that we can like reverse decode where the thinking is standing at the moment among the warmongers in uh, in the West. And, you know, this has been pointed out by several people, people among others, uh, Patrick Lawrence, who, who decoded this piece, um, calling it uh, uh, you know, saying that the West really has pinned itself into a very, very narrow corner, um, painting this this confrontation as a cosmic uh, conflict between the world's democracies and the world's autocracies, and that the the West can't really get out of this anymore, which is true. And then uh, Lawrence, Patrick Lawrence, uh, also says that look, this is this is ridiculous. This piece, this piece here, because it is written. Um, as an investigative report by two reporters, one based in Washington, D.C., the other one in New York. And neither of the two uh, is, is, is a correspondent in Ukraine. And they're talking about very intricate little details of, um, of how, they, how, they, uh, how things work on the ground, you know, getting your hands dirty. Uh, when these people, the, the dirtiest their hands got was probably... Uh, while while typing typing on the, on on their on the li little filthy keyboards, that's as, that's that's about as dirty as it gets. But um, you know, it even starts like this, right? Nestled in a in a dense forest, a Ukrainian military base appears abandoned and destroyed. Its command center, a burned out husk, a casualty of Russia's missile barrage early in the war. But that is above the ground. And now the investigative journalists, they go underground. They learn what the bunker, that there are bunkers, you know, with secret spy missions and sp secret spy centers. The underground bunker is a secret nerve center of Ukraine's military. And, you know, the idea that this piece was not written uh, with the explicit consent or actually at the commission of the CIA, who it talks about, is, is laughable, right? So this is clearly something that, 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 that was fed into the, the mainstream. And then the question is, though, what is it supposed to achieve, right? Um, the base is almost fully financed and partially equipped by the CIA, <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so if we if we depart from the idea that this piece was completely fed, as also Pat- Patrick Lawrence does, you know, completely fed into the the New York Times. Um, by the CIA itself, then what this tells us is that the CIA wants it known that it has been, you know, for 10 years defending um, bravely Ukraine and Ukrainians and helping Ukrainians, right? This is now a, 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 po- a point of pride um, that the New York Times is allowed to report on, that this that the support has been going on for so long, um, for a long time, and very e- explicitly, right? Without this is what the piece gets to, without uh, U.S. support, CIA support, you know, the Ukrainians wouldn't have been able to achieve this fantastic, fantastic uh, victories against the Russians, and ha- wouldn't have been able to defend themselves against the Russians. That's the narrative that's being sold here. The intelligence partnership between Washington and Kiev is a linchpin of Ukraine's ability to defend itself. The CIA and other American intelligence agencies provide intelligence for targeted missile strike, track Russian troop movements, and help support spy networks. In other words, um, whenever a Russian soldier gets killed, I mean, the CIA and the United States has its fair share of the cut, right, of saying, like, we we did our part in actually helping, um, helping kill the Russians and defend Ukraine, naturally, defend Ukraine. Um, I'm not saying the, the Ukraine is not defending itself. I'm saying the, um, the 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 CIA is here is here claiming it's it's part of this um, of the of the honors, right? Of saying like it wasn't just the Ukrainians, it wasn't just the weapons that we gave to them. It was the intelligence too. It was our intelligence. It was our our <laughs> brains and our knowledge that enabled them to do what what they did. Um, the the piece the piece continues with with trying to show how intimate this connection is and also how the connection came about it's a very long piece over 5000 words the relationship is so ingrained that cia officers remained at a remote location in western ukraine when the biden administration evacuated us personnel in the week before russia invaded in february 2022 um, and then the, an Ukrainian official is, is cited as without them, there would have been no way for us to resist the Russians uh, or to beat them, said Ivan Bakhanov, uh, who was then head of Ukraine's domestic intelligence agency in the SBU. And also the, you know, also the image language is um, is uh, is gruesome. I mean, here an, a picture of a of a dead Russian soldier. Uh, apparently, the, the, even his head coming off his body. I mean, absolutely, absolutely gruesome imagery, right? Um, but again, in in the tone of saying like we have to be um, proud of being able to to achieve so much uh, resilience in Ukraine. Uh, well, fine. Um, the details of this intelligence partnership, many of which are being disclosed by the New York Times for the first time, have been closely guarded secrets for a decade. So. If they have been closely guarded secrets for a decade, then why why would they come out now? And why would you pretend that this is in some form an investigative journalistic achievement when it is obviously with the, if not at the commission of the CIA, at least with its with its not. And as always, you know, they don't tell us like a lot of who their sources are because sources need to be protected, right? Um, and these uh, officials from the US and Ukraine, some of them only speak on conditions of anonymity. So it's like, I don't know why these journalists think that we still believe that this has anything to do with investigations the way that, you know, that real journalists like Seymour Hirsch would do when they reveal something that would actually hurt the system and uh, the uh, the central war state, right? This this is very much in support, and it's like applauding the, the the centralized war state and how awesome it has been supporting Ukraine. And if anything at all, it has been slow and too cautious in supporting uh, the Ukraine proxies in their war uh, in the war against uh, Russia, right? So. Anyhow, um, this one is probably clear, right? Uh, more than 200 interviews. 200 interviews. If this was true, I mean, 200 interviews takes in months and months in order to conduct. And even if it was 200 sources, written sources, I mean, this would be a very elaborate piece. But the timing, again, of this piece coming out when, you know, when you need support inside the United States for delivering weapons is so telling. So, okay, um... The make-believe in this in this article is huge. Um, 
Republicans in Congress, um, oh yeah, it of course also says so. If Republicans in Congress end military funding to Kiev, the CIA may, may have to scale back, ignoring that the CIA, of course, has its very own budget and doesn't rely on the 61 billion US dollars to, uh, in additional funding that are supposed to come in order to send more weapons to Ukraine, right? Uh, Mr. Putin has long blamed Western intelligence ag agencies for manipulating Kiev and sowing anti-Russian sentiment in Ukraine. Funny enough, this article actually more or less uh, co uh, co uh, confesses to exactly that, um, that there has been a long-standing uh, CIA uh, operation inside Ukraine and that they've been rooting out anything that would have been pro-Russian or that was pro-Russian before and um, thoroughly turned Ukraine against against the Russian enemy, right? This is exactly what the article actually commit, commit, um, uh, um uh, admits to, right? But the Times investigation found that Mr. Putin and his advisors misread the crit uh, a critical dynamic. The CIA didn't push its way into Ukraine. US officials were often reluctant to fully engage, fearing that the Ukrainian officials could not be trusted and worrying about pro provoking the Kremlin. So <laughs> the piece tries to spin it around, saying like it wasn't it wasn't the US that unduly tried to insert itself into Ukraine. It's, it's the US that was asked, it was begged to come and, and reluctantly, you know, it was over years, it took time until the US finally said, okay, fine, maybe our CIA can help you a little bit, just a little bit. And then the major part of the article, of course, criticizes that, that it took way too long until the, the US really uh, committed itself fully to to Ukraine. A tight circle of Ukrainian intelligence officials, officials assiduously courted the CIA and gradually made themselves vital to the Americans. As the partnership deepened after 2016, the Ukrainians became impatient with what they considered Washington's undue caution. This is the untold story of how, how it all happened. And <laughs> this is only the introduction, you know, it's a really long piece and, and goes deep. The cautious beginning, the CIA partnership in Ukraine can be traced back to two phone calls on the night of February 24th, 2014, eight years to the day before Russia's full-scale invasion. It's absolutely beautiful whenever, whenever you can make something very complex, so simple, and say like it was exactly eight years. You know, you don't need to uh, remember a second date, just remember the same date, but eight years earlier, we, we have the beginning, right? That's when the government's new spy chief, after, you know, uh, Yanukovych was chased out, the new spy chief... Uh, Valentin Nal 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 Nalvyachenko arrived at the headquarter of the domestic intelligence agency and found a pile of smoldering documents in the, in the courtyard. Inside, many of the computers had been wiped or were infected with Russian malware. I, it was empty. No lights, no leadership. Nobody was there. So the article tries to sell us that it was 2000 in 2014 when the relationship began. And, you know, the guy, the, the, the news by chief came into an empty building, right? Tabula rasa, nothing there before, everything out. And it's a new spy agency, and from the ground up, the this uh, SBU agency and the and the military arm as well were built up. They were new agencies, nothing else before. This is also so crazy, you know. Um, whenever you want to tell a story, you of course need to uh, need to have a neat beginning. And this idea here that before 2014, the CIA had nothing to do, you know, never ever did it come to the CIA's mind that anything could be going on with Ukraine. It was the, for the first time in 2014 that any kind of connection between um, the, the, the Ukrainians and the American secret services uh, happened. Um, that's a very neat story, which is, all, of course, also utterly completely fails. I mean, we know about the way that also Victoria Newland and the U.S. Embassy and so on were involved in the Maidan very much. And uh, you would have to be an idiot to believe that the CIA had nothing to do with all of that, right? But, okay, the piece then tries to establish that before 2014, before the, the revolution of dignity, no no hands, right, no, nothing, no, no touching of Ukraine, no touching. And then the Ukrainians come and ask and start begging the Americans to send um, to send their intelligence officers and share intelligence with them. The, the situation quickly became more dangerous. Mr. Putin sees Crimea. His agents fomented separatist rebellions that would become a war in the country's east. You know, the United States would never, ever foment a rebellion. Never. I mean, the the, the revolution of dignity in 2014, that was an indigenous uh, uprising against an evil dictator elected by the by by the people like three years earlier, but 
an evil dictator. You need to believe that. You're right, Yanukovych was evil and probably a dictator because otherwise the narrative doesn't work anymore. Um, so the, um, the Americans would never, ever foster something like that. Whereas the Russians, the Russians, of course, they foster uh, all of these uh, these separatist movements in the East. There, would, there wouldn't be any separatists. No Ukrainian in the East would ever dream of being a separatist if it wasn't for the evil Russians who go there and tell them that they have to do separatism, right? <laughs> That's the... Uh, oh, God... You know, you know these these great powers are all the same. They're all the same. Um, the P, the piece continues with like how the 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 relationship between these two were uh, was created and built up, and again how it was actually the Ukrainians that were begging for for weapons and support, um, and also how the how the Americans were very careful. We made a distinction between intelligence collection operations and things that go boom. A former U.S. senior official said. Um, implying that they wouldn't help the Ukrainians to blow up and kill uh, people inside Russia, right? They wouldn't give the Ukrainians the, uh, the, the intelligence they need in order to, to create, to attack uh, Russians. Um, General um, Kandruski decided to send a team into Crimea to plant explosives at the airfield so that they could, could be detonated if Russia moved to attack. And this time, he didn't ask the CIA for permission. Um, here he's talking about that previously uh, the, they were asking the CIA for help in, in blowing up something in, inside Russia, um, but the CIA said no because this was would be uh, would be too escalatory, and that this time they didn't do it. And I find this quite interesting actually because <laughs> look at this for a second. There's this um, the C this uh, Ukrainian spy agency agency chief, the general um, Kon Konradyuk, um, who, who decides to actually con do acts of war, right? If you, if you blow up, um, if you blow up infrastructure inside an, in another country, that is an act of war. This is why what Ukraine has been saying about Russia all along, right? Um, if the Russians help the separatists in the East and they attack our, our positions, then that's an act of war. Here we have the, we have the opposite. We have the Russia, the, the Ukrainians planning attacks. And interestingly enough, this is not Zelensky. 2016, this is not Zelensky doing the planning. It's, it's this general something, something. And they, they don't ask the American political leadership for support. They ask the, the American CIA or they decide not to ask the CIA for support, right? So the CIA made it abundantly clear, guys, if you want to blow up something in Russia, blow it up, but don't ask us before. We don't, we don't want to know about it. Um, and uh, it, it, you see, it, it's interesting because this article in a way also com uh, admits to the fact that um, states are not unitary actors. Zelensky, Biden, um, Obama at the time, uh, maybe maybe already Trump, they are not necessarily in, in charge um, of everything that's going on beneath them, of their these agencies, of how they work and what they, um, what they work with. These agencies sometimes very much move on their own, which is nothing new, you know, and this is not, 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 no, no conspiracy, nothing. Um, this is the same thing that happened to Japan in the Second World War. The Japanese central government in Tokyo was, off, was dragged into different, different theaters of war because its military and navy decided to just go, uh, go ahead and start shooting and start, start creating facts on the ground. And in this sense here, too, we see that the uh, secret services start creating facts on the ground and then they drag they drag the governments after them even if they don't want to and sometimes of course the governments do want that that's then what's really difficult to discern was this actually a politically uh, uh, commanded action or is it something that just that that happened because the people on the ground decided to create facts um but it basically the article basically admits to such um uh, to to such acts here and again this is not just the article this is the this is this was ticked off okay by by the people in the CIA right so they they are actually okay with uh, telling everybody that these spy agencies are basically out of control right and we know that for the United States I mean the CIA the FBI and so on even when there are congressional hearings they can refuse to actually um, to answer uh, to answer questions, so there is no real oversight over these uh, these things. So the CIA is very much a state inside, a state and acting on its own. In one joint operation, the HUR, the military arm of the of Ukraine's military uh, um, 
intelligence service, the HUR team dubbed an officer from Russia's military intelligence service into providing information that allowed the CIA to connect Russia's government to the so-called fancy bear hacking group, which had been linked to election interference efforts in a number of countries. Another one of these moments when the New York Times tries to again say without actually claiming it that Russia interfered in the US elections and you know that that, that Russian meddling in, in foreign elections is something that happens all the time, every time, all um, everywhere, and the Russians meddle in everything. This you know, the claim, the 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 Russia gate claim have so so thoroughly been disproven, even with two government investigations at the Mueller report, but the you the New York Times just wouldn't let go. You just need to make people believe that the Russians are uh, those uh, evil e- evil doers who try to influence the, the the election, and you can see how the 2024 election is already framed under such a a mindset, right? That the Russians will ha- will help uh, Donald Trump. Um, the result was a secret coalition against Russia, and the Ukrainians were vital members of it. So this is like then the the culmination of the article, also. Um, that that this this relationship, this marriage between the uh, the Ukrainian uh, agency and the the CIA is a vital part of defending uh, not just Ukraine but you know liberal democracy itself. After Mr. Putin launched the invasion on February twenty fourth, twenty twenty two, the CIA offices at the hotel were the only U.S. government presence on the ground. Every day at the hotel, they met with their Ukrainian contacts to pass information. The old handcuffs were off, and the Biden White House authorized spy agencies to provide intelligence support for lethal operations against Russian forces on Ukrainian soil. So here, here you've got it. Um, I mean, a more clear, um, a, a clear um, admission of U.S. direct involvement in the war. You know, not just non-belligerency, not just um, sending weapons, but actually providing the means necessary, not just the means, but the knowledge and the information and the targeting and so on, in order to 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 uh, kill Russians on the on the battlefield. That is. That has nothing to do anymore with some form of non-belligerency. This is co-belligerency. This is fighting um, the war already with the Ukrainians in Ukraine. And that is more or less the um, uh, what we take away from this article. In July 2022, Ukrainian spies saw Russian convoys pre- um, preparing to cross a strategic um, bridge across the Dnipro River um, and notified the MI6, uh, British and American intelligence officers, then quickly verified the Ukrainian intelligence using real-time satellite imagery. MI6 relayed the confirmation and the Ukrainian military opened fire with rockets destroying the convoys. <laughs> a, a, a direct, um, you know, step-by-step way that that Britain and the United States are involved in choosing targets and selecting them and then then executing the kills of these targets. Um, The question that some Ukrainian intelligence officers are now asking their American counterparts of Republicans in the House weigh whether to cut off billions of dollars in aid is whether the CIA will abandon them. It happened in Afghanistan before and now it's going to happen in Ukraine, a senior officer um, said. So this sets the tone, right? This is the big fear is that the money doesn't come. And also, please note how this how this sentence tries to frame um, the uh, where is it? The money is not. military equipment it is aid and it is not being provided it's it's um it's being cut off right the danger is that the aid is being cut off not that additional war material funding is being granted (laughs) although that's what it is so you know also the phrasing of these of these sentences is highly deceptive but um, I mean, we we know that by now. It's just important that we again and again remind ourselves to 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 actually read what is happening. Right? This is war material provision that is being that is, that is currently um, not happening, and the article frames it as aid that is being cut off. You know, it should be flowing. I mean, flowing is the natural state of of affairs, and it's being cut off by these evil Republicans um, uh, in the House. Oh my God! Anyhow, so. Um, a lot of people read it as read this piece as just more begging for money for funding from the US and also for for European support but I would really like to set this now into the, into the bigger picture uh of of what's what's currently happening um and that's also the other kind of revelations that we are seeing from the from the collective West, most importantly, that France has officially said now, Macron has said, we cannot ro- um, rule out 
going to war um, with Russia inside Ukraine, sending boots on the ground. And, you know, um, as I said in the beginning, if the proxy war fails, then there are not many awesome options left, right? Right. You either have to accept uh, that, that this proxy war is ending and then it's, uh, we, we will see happening what happened to South Vietnam in 1975, right? South Vietnam ceased to exist. And today, we the Vietnam we know today, that's North Vietnam, right? That's the entire scenario that the United States tried to prevent with its um, first a proxy war and then a, a hot war in, in Vietnam is that what in the end happened, um, took place, that South Vietnam was eradicated. Um, and then, ironically enough, less than 50 years later, the United States then makes a big deal with exactly that North, North Vietnam uh, and creates a strategic partnership with them, which also shows you how absolutely dumb these wars are and how dumb, dumb these proxy wars are. I mean, as soon as there's a good reason to kind of let go and forget about the past, states will do that. They will immediately do that. It didn't even take 50 years for the U.S. to become a strategic partner of North, of North Vietnam, right? Not even 50 years of the people who they fought in the trenches. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's 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 crazy. But, um, you know, the other thing, the, the Vietnam War could have been ended way earlier already in 68, 69, right? Um, when it was clear that the South Vietnamese lacked what it took in order to uh to to fight the north north, north vietnamese uh and that's when the 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 us the us could have con completely withdrawn but of course the opposite happened um the us then had to commit its own soldiers in order to keep the the war the war going on and having it have a chance um at all to actually uh defeat the uh, the North Vietnamese who were supported, um, who were proxies of the Chinese and, uh, and the Soviet Union to some, uh, to some degree, but mainly, mainly, uh, uh, mainly uh, communist China. But um, <clears throat> you see, this is the point we're at now. The question is withdraw and let the Ukraine, let Project Ukraine, the, the proxy war go or, or double down and give them the one thing that they, you cannot pay with money, and that is um, new Ukrainian, new meat for the meat grinder, right? Um, this this is the the ultimate escalation. And we see how in the in the West this is being cheered on. Here we have an observer, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the Guardian um, headline under this, the, the title, the observer, right, of what's happening. Um, the view on Emmanuel Macron, hawkish uh, Ukraine remarks, focus uh, minds on Europe's future. And this article is very much in support of this, right? Yet, yet if Macron's intervention has concentrated my, minds and focused attention on, on flailing efforts to prevent a disastrous um, per precedent setting victory for Russian aggression, it will have been justified. Few will say it out loud, but Ukraine is not winning this war. Its counteroffensive has stalled. It is losing ground. Promised arms and ammunition deliveries have not materialized. Frontline soldiers and civilians are exhausted. A tipping point may be approaching. Yes, yes, this is exactly it. A tipping point is coming. Um, this crisis is no longer, in truth, never was entirely about Ukraine. <laughs> Yes, the Western media is actually starting after two years to, to actually tell us what it is about. By firing up debate, Macron sounded a timely warning, a timely warning about the future security of Europe as a whole. The urgent need is for fewer plans and meetings and more concentrate action to help Kiev win. War. We want war. We are the Guardian. We want war. We want war. Go to war. Um, or at least stave off defeat. The bigger question concerns Europe's deepening, uh, deepening jeopardy in the East. Russia is advancing, and Putin, fresh from uh, murdering Alexei Navalny and primed for a phony re-election triumph, has um, has his tail up in the West. Then no, the noisome Trump, more an enemy than ally, is slouching ruddily back into view. Time is running short to Russia-proof Europe. <laughs> the Guardian wants war. The Guardian really, really wants the now the Europeans commit their, their boots. And of course, from a US perspective, this is also another best case scenario, because if the Ukrainians can do it alone, then just send Germans and French and a couple of, of troops in there, right? But the, 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 the Europeans actually know that, which is why this is all a trial balloon. Um, un, until and unless the US also commits its troops, they wouldn't go. They won't fight the Russians. I don't believe the, the Europeans are pretty dumb. Pretty, pretty dumb, but they're not dumb enough to try to fight the Russians alone. 
they were they they are waiting. They're looking to the west to see if if Big Daddy uh, United States is actually would would agree to sending troops. And that that one is the big question. Um, although the European war hawks, they would also love to actually to finally have um, some sort of military vehicle that they can control on their own and maybe you know test it out a little bit with the Russians. But they know that this is dangerous. If you test out a new military uh, con, uh, uh, con con um, a new military setting inside Ukraine, then um, you know who knows where this where this is going to go. And they are aware that this is dangerous, so they still look to the to the U.S. But at the same time, we we see, you know, also this whole talk about Germany um, that was just embarrassed and Germany that embarrassed the U.K. At the moment, what we are seeing is um, the Russians, of course, just um, uh, this weekend. They published a phone, a recording of like several German generals who were discussing how to attack, um, how to use German weapons to attack the the bridge, the the Crimean bridge that that connects uh, uh, Russia to 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 Crimea. And this is this is a huge revelation, right? And this is very very da- damaging and damning. And this is one of the first times that the Russians try to use public opinion in the West in order to. Uh, in order to get get some change in policy happening, and if this is clearly, clearly, utterly, the Russians telling the Europeans, guys, we know exactly what you're up to. We know that you're preparing for attacks. We have all the proof we need. Here is one little bit of peace that we that we are feeding to you and f- to your media. Um, we know what you're up to. So don't try. Don't think that you can hide your scheming. Um, just because you're sitting in Berlin and Paris, we know. And at the same time, the Germans and the French and the British, you know, the the, the Germans uh, just recently, Olaf Scholz uh, revealed that the MI6 is uh, in, in, intricately also involved in the in the choosing of targets and in deploying their weapons against against the Russians. And the the, the British have, have pretended that they're very angry, very angry at Mr. Scholz for um, divulging such an um, uh, such, such a secret. While at the moment these secrets, these secrets are being like um, sawn out left and right. Right? It's like like you're you're planting something on a field and you're just throwing out the seeds um, to grow. And I, my fear is that that's exactly what we're going through. While these governments pretend that they're very unhappy with these leaks and very unhappy that people are 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 um, are, are leaking stuff, it's actually preparing the ground. It's preparing you. It's preparing me. Um, to the next step, which is to say that, look, we've, we know that we've been involved now for two years. So actually, you know, sending troops officially is not an escalation. It's not going to be an escalation. We have been involved already. The Russians accepted that, that we are involved. And now we're just sending a little bit more. So we are not escalating. We are just helping the Ukrainians a bit more now. That is my fear, that we are being prepared. The European public is being prepared and it's being being you know mellowed down. It's massaged into our brains that the next step of escalation and uh, a direct involvement of uh, troops on the ground that that is just the next logical step because we've already been at war in war um, and this war is now not growing. It's we are just trying to reinforce our front lines, right? Um, yeah, because. Because this is where we are in this war, you know, the proxy war is failing. So a lot of things have to come out, a lot of things, not because they're being investigated or because they're being uh, revealed by, by, you know, brave Julian Assange or Edward Snowden's. That's not what's happening. These people, these people here, these, these, uh, these uh, empire supporters, these, these, um, these, these, writers for the empire they will never go to prison right they will never ever be in belmarsh these people these two guys here adam entus and michael schwartz they uh, they do the bidding they do what the what the empire asks them to do um but you and i it's being massaged into our brains now that that the whole involvement of the us has already been like tremendous it really this really now reminds me of the second world war and how the united states for the first two years of the war kind of pretended not to be part of it while it was preparing everything, everything it could on the ground in order to make sure that once it really enters the war, it can enter it with all the fanfare and so on it takes. Um, of course, it was then the, the Japanese who were dumb enough to actually they give them the, uh, the, the actual excuse uh, and bombed them, bombed them into the Second World War. And um, yeah, Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor. Will we have another Pearl Harbor? 
pretty soon, you know, something that 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 will then turn the tide in the US and in Europe and make a total war something that a majority of people want because at the moment they don't want it. So um, unless there is some form of Pearl Harbor, uh, we might not get it. But these these things here seem to me very much to be happening in preparation for in preparation for escalation. I do hope that the 2024 election maybe maybe turns things around, but I'm not very hopeful. Um, I also know that there's there's forces inside the United States who disagree with this, right? There's there's the Tucker Carlson's and so on who don't want to fight Russia because they want to save that uh, that potential to fight China. Uh, I know that, but this is again the United States is not a unitary actor. The Europeans are not unitary actors. States are not unitary actors. You have different levels and different different decision makers who have different capabilities and abilities, and especially the CIA is one that can act on its own um, in a certain in in certain in certain areas if they want to. But in order to get more war, what you what you often need is not a big political decision. It's it's enough if you've got something happening on the ground. And the CIA is very, very good when it comes to these kind of issues. Um, my friends, let's see how this continues. Thank you.